Welcome in to DMVR Buffs Live, presented by the Colorado Exos. If you haven't checked out the Colorado Exos yet, they're a rugby team, um, and you should be following them. They're doing a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, now is the time to tune into the DMVR Buffs, or the DMVR Rugby Podcast, the uh, DMVR Rugby it. Twitter account, all that, that stuff, because Olympic Rugby is here, so check all that out. Our, our man, Colton Strickler. Uh, I'm Henry Chisholm. I'm here with uh, the draft guy, Andre Simone, and we're talking Pac-12 Media Day. I'm a... Uh, in LA, had a chance to talk to a whole bunch of football players, whole bunch of football coaches today. Uh, we're going to have videos of my interviews with Dimitri Stanley and Nate Landman. Uh, it should be a good time. How's it going it, back in Colorado, Dre? It's going well. It's a little hot. And because I'm a betting man and I even bet on the weather, I mm -hmm. assume that it's much cooler over there in Los Angeles where you are. It's feeling a little toasty out here in Los Angeles. Maybe not as bad. I don't know. But uh, I am really sweaty and really excited to go home and take a shower after nine hours, ten hours here today. It's been a long time. Excellent. Well, what would you find out out there? Well, uh, let's just start by going to the all-conference teams. I, I, I think that you know the big news today is that uh, those come out. Um, we get to see who the all-conference players are, the preseason media picks uh, for the Pac-12 North and the Pac-12 South. I, I'm a voter, by the way, so if you don't like any of it, you might be able to blame me. Um, yep. But yeah, let, let's yep. just jump in with uh, the uh, all-Pac-12 teams. And what's, what's mm -hmm. the first thing that stands out to you, Dre? Well, from a buff standpoint, I'm sure you were not too pleased to see Carson Wells excluded. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't yeah. believe it. I didn't think there was a chance. I mean, so first of all, it does hurt his case that there's a, you know, it's a 4-3 defense that they make instead of a 3-4 defense. It's crazy. And so yeah. there's only three linebackers on each team. But yeah, he Six wasn't on the first still. team. He wasn't on the second team. He was an honorable mention linebacker after what? Leading the nation in tackles for loss last year per game. Uh, sixth in sacks per game last season. Crazy, crazy that he wasn't on there. Yeah, it's really pretty wild. And um, you can get into the four, three, three, four type stuff. But a guy like Drake Jackson, who's anything but, you know, uh, an off ball linebackers on that first team, um, probably the the more debatable inclusion in the first team there. But I mean, I'd really start with the linebackers because it's a loaded group. You do have Devin Lloyd, Nate Landman, and Drake Jackson as your first teamers. Hard to argue against that group, um, especially when you have a guy like Noah Sewell, arguably the most talented freshman in the country uh -huh. in a linebacker spot as well. He's excluded from the first team. I, I know a lot of people in publications that had him as kind of a preseason defensive player of the year right there with his teammate, Kayvon Thibodeau. Um, so he gets bumped down to the second team, but Carson being excluded is a, is a tough one to understand. Um, and, you know, he's got guys like Avery Roberts and uh, Edufan Olufushu uh, from Washington in front of him. I don't know, man. Um, hard to say yeah. that they deserve to be there in front of Wells. Yeah, I mean, 
and, and that's the thing. And like, I don't want to like bash guys, especially because there's still a couple of them sitting like right over there. Um, but yeah, you yeah. know, to me, this was the group that I put together, except instead of Avery Roberts, it was Carson Wells. Um, you know, it just sucked. You know, a guy like Noah Sewell, you brought him up. He's just kind of the, the sexy pick. He was a former, what, number two linebacker in the country. He's kind of a breakout player. He, mm -hmm. what, 260 pounds, but moves so much better than that. He's, he's just like this freak athlete. He, he's a really good football player. He's a lot of fun to watch. But also, you look at just the pure production from Carson Wells last year and what that defense mm -hmm. accomplished. And mm -hmm. to yeah. not have him in any of those six spots, it's just really brutal. Yeah, that's the bigger thing is what that defense accomplished last year, playing more games than most Pac-12 South teams mm -hmm. and not getting a ton of love. You do see Terrence Lang in there. Makai Blackman, which, man, um, like what a what a transformation Makai Blackman's had since you've been covering this team, Hank. Yeah. It, he's he's, you know. he's turning into a lockdown guy. And, you know, I guess you guys will hear it later on. But when I had a chance to sit down and talk to Nate Landman, I asked him, like, one name on the defense, one guy who's going to step up. He said Christian Gonzalez. And so if you have Christian Gonzalez turning into, and you'll hear what Nate has to say, but Nate really praised that guy. If he's a number one lockdown corner and he fits that profile better, you know, he's longer, right. he's that type of athlete. All of a sudden you can move Makai Blackman around. He's going up against number two receivers that secondary could really be devastating. And, you know, it, it was nice to see Makai Blackman get a little bit of recognition because mm -hmm. you see a lot of lists, mm -hmm. a lot of different places where he's kind of the forgotten guy. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if I had to bet, you know, who was going to be excluded from the all Pac-12 second team mm -hmm. um, in the preseason rankings, you know, I would have had Carson Wells as a strong, strong favorite over Makai Blackman. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, obviously, Nate Landman is first team. We, we touched on that. No surprise there. Terrence Lang getting second team. You know, he has all of the tools and he has mm -hmm. produced. It just comes in spurts. And for him, if, if, if he becomes that like every down type of player where he's just consistently wreaking havoc, you could totally see it. But you know, I, I wasn't sure if Terrence Lang was going to make the cut here. Um, definitely excited to see him on this list. What an impressive group of defensive linemen, though, from Kayvon Thibodeau to Mika Tafua, Thomas Booker, who David Shaw today repeatedly said is one of the best defensive linemen in America. And it's kind of tough to argue against that. Mm -hmm. And Jermaine Lole, one of my guys down at Arizona State. I, it's a good group of defensive linemen from the Pac-12 this year. Yeah, and I mean, the, the linebackers are really strong, and uh, you've got some real versatility and some household names like Mikel Wright and, uh, you know, Chase Lucas stand out yep. above all of those on top of <clears throat> everyone else you got in there. What about the offense, Hank? What, mm -hmm. uh, where did your rankings differ from, from what ended up being the consensus here? I was so, I was happy to see the the running backs. I think most people from Colorado would be. Yep, yep. It, it makes sense. Jarek, he's the reigning Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year. He mm -hmm. did so many different things, broke a bunch of records, was in all the national conversations for best running back. But still, when you get to today, you think like the media, you know. Hasn't always right. been in love with right. Colorado. And you could see him being snubbed, especially because there are some pretty impressive backs up there. Um, but Max Borgie gets in there, another Colorado guy. Then the second yep. team, CJ Verdell. Rashad White, though, from Arizona State. That was the interesting inclusion to me. Good running back for sure, but splitting time yes. with Trianum, I think is how you pronounce his name. Uh, there's a great running back, the one who made my ballot. Um, it was these three, but instead of uh, the Arizona State kid, it was, uh, oh, what is his name? It's, it's not Zach Britton from uh, down at UCLA. Um, oh, wow. Good group there, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a really talented group, and CJ Burdell deserves to be in there and uh i'd like to know who was your first team quarterback because keaton slovis okay i get it um, <laughs> yeah and kale we can think... scroll up a little bit and see these uh it's you 1a know, 1b here 
it was. And this is going to surprise you, Dre, because Jaden Daniels is my guy. Um, mm-hmm. For those who don't know, in the DNVR Madden League, I've been rolling with Jaden Daniels for, I think I'm in my fifth season now. Okay. And so, you know, getting to go like watch him. I decided not to bring it up today. I figured that would be a weird to do. But but yep. I'm a big fan of his game. I've had a lot of fun watching him. I still put him second, though. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about the hmm. uh, the the preseason uh, all uh, what are they whatever they call it the preseason poll I guess um, I knocked him down because Arizona State with Herm Edwards standing right over there it's a <laughs> it's a shady situation right now oh and, no uh, I mean you have to kind of expect that to impact them on the field right even if they're not gonna you know wipe out the coaching staff or whatever. If, if it's 1A, 1B, you give the A to the guys where it's just a little bit healthier situation. Yeah, I mean, Clay Helton's been on the uh, the hot seat for like most of our lifetimes. Yep. And color me skeptical that this is the year USC figures it all out under Helton. Uh, so that that would be my Slovis skepticism, but I, I get you. And uh, mm-hmm. those situations, it either goes one of two ways. 70% of the time, it just <laughs> collapses and burns in catastrophic mm-hmm. fashion. And then 30% of the time, a team gets motivated by that kind of rally, says, hey, it's out of our control. <laughs> what we can't co- control is this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they dedicate themselves to each other and whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, I, I will say, yeah. though, seeing Keaton Slovis today, not as uh-huh. big as I expected. Like, like hmm. I saw him walking around. I was like, that's absolutely Keaton Slovis. I know what he looks like. Like he's in uh-huh. good shape. Like football players just like look different, you know? Yeah. But he's also like, I, I would have expected a couple more inches on him. Um, that's more of like a draft pod conversation maybe. But, but that was one of my other takeaways today. Kayvon Thibodeau, really, really big. Keaton Slovis, surprisingly not, not that big. Yeah, I see him listed at 6'3", 205, you know, give or take something. That's pretty average yeah. size. Pretty average right there. Yeah, um, it's average. Might have been a little bit generous there. I'll, I'll, I think that Brant Cuthy, the tight end out of Utah, being excluded from both first teams with Carson Wells is probably the biggest omission here. I'm not sure how that happens in a conference where most teams played five games last year at best. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to exclude a guy that the year prior to that was really a standout in the conference seems a bit off when, you know, Kate Otten of Washington and uh, Greg Dulcich, they, they're kind of promises just like Kuthi is at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that that's fair. And I think it also helps, you know, UCLA, they've put a couple of tight ends in the league recently uh Washington they must have I can't think of any off the top of my head but yeah Caleb Wilson came out very recently there you go. Yeah. Yeah. yep to me though I mean this was the position where I was the most different than any of the others uh, you see Kate Otten and Greg Dulcich there I had uh I had Keithy one and I had Brady Russell from Colorado too and oh, I you mean know, I right there, a little bit of projection there with Brady for sure, but you know, going back and watching that game, the, the one game he played last year, he was dominant. Five catches, 77 yards, doing a bunch of different things. Uh, he was catching little screen passes and making plays. He was being a little outlet underneath. He was stretching the mm-hmm. seam. He was picking up third mm-hmm. downs. He was going deep. So many different things. On top of that, what he's best at is blocking. And, you know, I really can't like knock somebody Great for uh, like, leaving him off just because it was by far the best game of his career. Nobody put up that many yards since 2012 from that position for CU, but you see the pieces there. And if, if the idea here is that we pick the players we think are going to be, you know, the all pac 12 at the end of the year, I, I saw enough to believe. Yeah, that's uh that's interesting. It's a great point. I hadn't thought but uh, about that, but yeah, Russell could totally have the production to, you know, Mm -hmm. Even if these guys have maybe more NFL talent, you know, and go higher in the draft, as far as having more of a standout season in the Pac-12, um, you know, it, absolutely, I think it's right there. Drake London, I see no issue with uh, at wide receiver. 
So I think yep. Drew McCoy could really blow up at USC this year. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know. Did you feel there were any notable omissions on the wide receiver side? I guess, you know, the problem with CU is you've got so much talent, but who would you bet on to be the most productive? Uh, I guess Demetrius Stanley is out there, yep. right? So yep. CU is kind of betting that that would be the guy, but, uh, you know, there'd be – There'd be plenty of choices, and that might be what hurt a CU candidate at wide receiver in the all conference team. Ab absolutely. And, you know, this I think was my group. I'm trying to remember. I didn't have Johnny Johnson in there. I had somebody else, but I can't remember who I wound up choosing. I think it was Renard Bell from Oregon State, but oh. I'm pretty sure he actually tore his ACL in the last couple of days. So they might have mm. taken him off anyway. Um, I'm Another surprised KD today, Nixon though. didn't get more love. Yeah, I know. I know. I, did, I, didn't get to, I was busy when Clay Hilton was talking. I wanted to ask mm -hmm. him about KD and, and see what the plan was there. Keaton, too, I guess. But uh, Britton Covey, you, you, you know he's, he's Deserve. small. Yeah, yeah, but like slot guy, returner type. For sure. Another one that you look at and you're like, of all these really big football players walking around here. Right. Right. I, I honestly checked because I couldn't remember who they brought. And so I looked on the program and was like, did they like bring a punter or something like a long snapper? Like, well, who is this guy? But I mean, he produces and I voted for him. There you go. Yeah. Um, You have any big offensive line takes or should we move? Or I guess before we get to the uh, preseason poll, we should probably take a quick break. But any other thoughts here? No, just, I mean, Kirkland, Lucas are musts at tackle to have in the preseason. Some of mm -hmm. the top offensive tackles in the entire country. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of crazy that uh, the Cal kid, Michael Safel, <laughs> retired after voting. So, yep. you know, honestly, I'd fill that and have a revote there. And I wonder if any of CU's guys would get some love. But, you know... <laughs> And in the trenches, especially like, geez, we had such little football played in this conference last year. It, it, I'm, I'm happy with the 10 we got and I'm not going to nitpick too much. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's fair. Um, I guess bef before we move on to the break, should say Isaiah Lewis was a honorable mention all pack 12. Uh, I'm pretty sure that means you needed to get four votes out of 38 eight something like that um uh -huh. but he was honorable mention uh brady brady russell actually wasn't honorable mention which means well, maybe yeah. i'm crazy but uh i thought there was one maybe. more near oh yeah carson wells of course honorable mention the snub of the day i would say yeah yeah but hey All it's right. more uh locker room material it's more billboard material yep okay let's uh let's knock out a couple ads we'll hit this uh the preseason poll and then uh, play those interviews. They're on the way with Dimitri Stanley and Nate Landman had some really cool stuff to say, saving those for the end. Um, first though, Breckenridge brewery. Uh, yeah. Those are our people down there. A lot of really good beers. Can't go wrong. Whether it's the uh, strawberry sky. I feel like in the summer, my, my answer is always a strawberry sky. It's like always that's a go -to. strawberry sky. Yeah. Yeah. It's summer in a can. It's delicious. It doesn't is. overpower I, you with the strawberry. It's a nice mm -hmm. lager, nice and light, sits well in your stomach. You can crush plenty. It's just good stuff. It's, it's a nice refresher. Do you guys realize we're in summer, summer number three of Strawberry Sky already? Feels wow. like that drink was just yesterday. No it way. Does. Is that right? Third, it's our third yeah. Straw Sky summer. That is crazy. Happy third year anniversary, Strawberry mm -hmm. Sky. Wow. Yep. And if you guys haven't checked it out, you can use the beer locator on Breckenridge Brewery's website. It'll send you to, uh, it'll like tell you all the different places you can pick up whatever beer seltzer it is that you want to try from Breckenridge. Uh, it's a great tool. Put it to good use because there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, also, want to give a shout out to our friends over at Solace Meds. Yeah. Uh, they always take care of the DMVR family. They've got four locations uh, scattered all around. No matter where you are in Colorado, there's going to be one close to you. Um, and if you're at the DMVR bar, there's one really close to you, just a couple blocks mm -hmm. away um, down uh, Colfax. Uh, they've got a bunch of awesome deals, as always. Um, wild night and day gummies. Buy one, get one 50% off. All one is 25% off. All open cured resin cartridges, 20% off. All green dot concentrates, 20% off. 
uh, 1 to 11 rosin combs, 20% off. So many really great deals going on. Plus, if you go to the Wheat Ridge location, you can get a free Solace Bar or King Cone when you mention the code DNVR. Um, if you, uh, you order online, you can use the code DNVR20 from any location. Yep. Get 20% off every single time. So definitely uh, hit up our great friends over at Solace Meds. All those discounts lasting through July. So get yep. it in this week. Yep. Yep. And if you didn't like what you heard, there's going to be a whole nother batch next week. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler alert. But yes. I don't, I don't know how you could not like those though. Okay. Um, <laughs> Kale, can we see this uh, all what, the preseason poll? I, I, I hate that. I hate how you have to say that. Um, I mean, big news here for Colorado. Obviously they come in fifth in the South. Uh, you'll you'll hear Nate Landman's thoughts about that later on in the show. Um, he thinks it's wrong, though. A little, little spoiler there. <laughs> um, outside of that, I mean, Dre, what stands out to you here? Yeah, um, gosh, USC not surprisingly getting a ton of love. Mm -hmm. Oregon more surprisingly, to me at least, getting a lot of love. Um, you know, when... I, I don't know if I was Washington, I'd take that as a little bit of a disrespect. You know, I mean, what's Oregon's lost a lot. They don't have a returning quarterback, you know, so USC has got that going for them. At least Arizona state's got that going for them. And I don't know how you could overlook Utah um, with kind of the track record they've had and going through those teams. And, you know, like UCLA ahead of the buffs is just, it's brutal. It's nuts. I mean, considering what the Bruins and Buffs have been the last five years, the directions those programs have gone in, mm -hmm. uh, you're just not really paying attention if that's your rankings. And just so, you know, we make sure. Um, but, you know, that's the Vegas odds. Same thing. Plus 1,200 UCLA to win the conference. Plus 3,500 for the Buffs to win the conference. Utah, though, plus 600. So at least Vegas is a little more in line with me on that. But again, Oregon, where's it coming from? Because they just, I mean, you know nothing about this next team outside fair, of yeah. Thibodeau and Noah Sewell. You know nothing about that team. And you do know, though, that there's just a bunch of four and five stars all over that roster. And, and every year, the recruiting class is at the top of the Pac-12. You know, we talked about yeah. Noah Sewell yeah. being a, a great linebacker, being number two in his recruiting class. Well, number one is uh, Justin Flo, who also went to Oregon, and he's probably going to be on the field this year. Right. And so I think, right. you know, to me, that's, that's why I actually did put Oregon first, because they have so yeah. much talent. Sure. They have so much sure. talent. And Washington, I think, has a couple of the same questions that Oregon has. You know, oh, big time. You lo look at the quarterback spot. Um, Oregon, you know, you get to at least bank on all those running backs being productive and with an offensive line no. that, that's been right. good consistently. It's a lot of question marks, but it's consistently good and has been since Mario Cristobal, an offensive line guy. Uh, right. Actually, Bronco right. for just a minute back in the day. Bronco offensive lineman. Crazy. Not for long, but uh, he's, he's that coach there. So that was my logic. Right, right. No, I I hear you. Um, it, I mean, it just goes to show you how wide open this conference is. By far the most open Power Five conference because yeah. I would have I would have USC and Utah probably ahead of and Arizona State probably ahead of anyone in the North because I I really don't know what they're doing at quarterback out of out of work. Yeah. Uh, I'll also add UCLA actually got a first place vote. Unbelievable. What are we doing? Unbelievable. What are we doing? Unbelievable. Um, but at least there's a quarterback returning there, which senior, if you were to power problems, rank, but... right. And I mean, you know, I was looking at the Heisman odds as well, which we have, we have on the app now. Um, and it's Slovis, Jaden Daniels, and then Dorian Thompson, it's those three guys and no one else from the Pac-12. So, okay, I get it. You know, you're you're a bit star centric. You uh, you should get out of LA more if UCLA is your first team mm -hmm. vote. But you know, qu quarterbacks matter. Quarterbacks matter. I'm. I hope I'm the first person to tell you that today. Yeah, you definitely are. Good. Good. Um, awesome. 
I'll also throw in here, you know, Arizona State was a tough one for me to place with everything that's going on over there. You know, sure. uh, they would have been my number one in that uh, division if not for, you know, the for, for those who don't know, I guess we're hinting at it a lot. A bunch yeah. of recruiting violations, bringing kids on campus during the recruiting dead period because of COVID. Not allowed to do that. They're uh, they're in trouble. Um, so what do you do about that? Correct. You know, uh, do, do you it's knock correct. them down from one to two, from two to three? It's it, it was really tough for me, and I think I think I put them three or four. It's hard though. It's hard though. Like because I could see a lot of different things happening. Are you worried Herm's going to be fired halfway through the season because the scan, like the violations from the scandal, come down and then? I, I I'm like amazed it hasn't screwed? happened yet. <laughs> like like, and <laughs> that's what throws wrong. the whole thing off. Is like I thought that would have happened. Like I've had a lot of great experiences with Herm in my life, which is a weird thing to be able to say. But very I've odd, had good experiences with Herm, and I love the guy. But also, with all that coming out, how is that staff not just cleared out? And now you're to the point where it's like, well, you don't you don't do it now. That doesn't make any sense. Right? Like <laughs> it's it's a it's a tough situation. Uh, so yeah. at the very <laughs> least, I'm thinking it's gotta be distracting, right? Like there's gonna be NCAA investigators just consistently in there talking to people. Yeah, well, can't how, be how would great. you rank the South? Can't be great. I mean, you make a great point, you know? Um, I mean, I hate, I don't believe, like, my heart tells me it's probably Utah, Arizona State, USC, Colorado, and Clay Hilton's fired by week eight. Um, and, yeah. you know, I'm with you, but Arizona State's a really tough one to gauge. And, Utah's like, wow, actually last year was phenomenal for, I mean, you know, aside from the tragedy that happened, um, yeah. that, you know, it's a great year because we lost, we lost a, a stud at quarterback. We lost a stud at running back. We were able to develop guys. We're still, still yep. going to be really tough on defense. We're going to be really tough in the trenches. We might have the best tight end in the in the conference. We might have the mm -hmm. the defensive player of the year in Devin Lloyd. You know they're just gonna slow and steady. Teams go into their place, hate it. All these California teams, it sucks yeah. to go to Utah and play. It's the longest travel. The weather's horrible to adjust to. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think Utah has some massive advantages with the kind of flux the conference is going to have. On paper, USC should be it. Because they've got so much Absolutely. talent. And like this is the first year in a while where I wouldn't say, oh man, USC's lost a lot of talent. Like, yeah, they look, they've lost consecutive years, first round offensive linemen. That's gonna mm -hmm. hurt, blah, blah, blah. But if Slovis stays healthy, the receiving core is gonna be dynamic. You so I good. could recruit running backs at USC. I, I mean, yeah. you're gonna have like four and five stars just like you know, as walk-ons, essentially. Mm -hmm. The defense is going to be stout. Drake Jackson's a stud. They've got studs all over. So, you know, yep. they should win the South, but again, they, they should have won the South. That's the narrative of the Pac-12 no. South for several years, and Clay Hilton's not doing it, and they, yep. they're so bad, they can't even find a viable replacement at a program like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, if I'm stacking it all up, that is not where I would suggest people put their money on who wins the conference, despite everything on paper adding yep. up, you know? Yeah. And and to me, so I look at Utah and say, I don't think their ceiling's high enough. I, I, I like all a, good the, point. a lot a good of what point. they have. But then you look back at what's happened in the Pac-12 the last four or five years, whatever. And it's been Utah in the championship game half the time, at least. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's... It, it's going to be a really competitive Pac-12 South this year. And, and I think the door is wide open for Colorado. You know, the, that opening schedule is tough, getting USC and Arizona mm -hmm. State right yeah. away. Yeah. But who knows? There's clouds hanging over Arizona State. You could totally see this USC team just blowing a game week one mm -hmm. because they find ways to blow games. They also, I mean, I don't know. 
they, they, they got the breaks last year. You know, they opened the season with what? It's like a 28-27 win or something right, against right. Arizona State where they score 14 points in the last three mm-hmm. minutes because they convert an onside kick. And, and that's why they make it as far as they made it last year because of that. You know, here's, what, here's, here's a team that I'm going to look out for uh, from the north. I think Stanford's underrated. I know Dude, that they've, they've been a little bit down, but I mean, 100%. yeah, they were what, like four and eight two years ago, yeah. which is, it's, it, it was bad. And last year they had the tough start. They lost their first two games, but after that put together four solid wins right. to end the year. Right. It's a weird year where there's, there's no fall ball. Uh, most schools wind up with half as right. much spring ball as they usually get. And, and what is Stanford's strength? The coaches, yeah, the David and Shaw the coaches, and that right. staff, and, right. and giving them less time. Who's surprised that they, they were slow starters? Totally. I, uh, totally. There's definitely reasons to be skeptical. Sure. You know, you do wonder, like, who scores the points and, yeah. and, and things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I do think that there's a world in which Stanford is right in this right at the very end. I agree completely. I mean, because Washington's in mega flux. Mm-hmm. Oregon, we're going to see. I mean, Oregon's got like. Oregon has that designer markup price. But so far, it's been sold at discount stores because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's Nike quality. But what do you have to show for it? They need to mm-hmm. prove that they can pump out pros year after year. And this this new recruiting method of, of going after big dogs and they're bringing them in is going to work where you can have a team full of Noah Sewells ready to contribute right away as freshmen, sophomores, and just yeah. pick up where the guy left off to go to the pros. And it's just, you know, it's just Clemson, Alabama, West, and they can churn yep. them out. Show me you can do that. And... uh you know, oh, and I w- honestly, I would buy Colorado a lot more if there wasn't this uncertainty at quarterback. Um, you know, fair. I bought what they Absolutely. had going on last year, and maybe Neuer didn't give him the highest ceiling, but he gave him a pretty high floor. I know. What do it's, you have now? Replacing Neuer is a weird conversation <laughs> because of th- there are plenty of weaknesses that you point to. And, and oh, some sure. of those you can kind of explain away by the shoulder injury he had in the second game. And he's right. going right. into the locker room at the end of the season, getting shot up in his throwing arm. That's not right. That's not what you want. No. But also, I mean, he was still what? There's 17 of 24. I've said this over and over again. 17 of 24 scoring touchdowns in the red zone last year. And Sam Neuer is a big reason why. So is Jarek. But going back to the Oregon thing, you reminded me, the line of the day today, uh, somebody asked Chip Kelly, what's the difference in college football from the time you're Oregon till, till now? And he said, well, back then we had shiny helmets and we put five receivers on the field. Now everybody has shiny helmets and they put re- five receivers on the field. So like, that's, that's, that's kind of it. That's so kind of true. It. <laughs> it's yeah, absolutely everyone it. is Oregon now. Yeah, like, that's yep. right. Find Those uniforms else. don't stand out nearly as much no. as they used to. You're not getting no. the recruiting benefits. Everybody's just gone full on spread, speed, all that. I, I like that guy. And you know, David Shaw Man. was talking about him too. We can get into some of this like general takeaways from the day stuff, I guess. Yeah. But, but David Shaw brought it up. He said, you know, Chip Kelly doesn't get nearly enough credit for what he did for college football. You know, whatever is happening is happening, but he changed the game and he's absolutely right. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, he really changed and he really made it. I mean, he he defined what that era of football became um, and especially like made it really consumable and embraced by younger folks, which as we were younger, as that was all going in, we got caught up in that, whether we wanted to or not, you know? So, yeah. um, Yeah, man. Yeah, no, that's really cool. That's cool that David Shaw says that too, because I think, frankly, I don't know that that man gets enough credit for the kind of stuff he's brought to college football and what have you. And, you know, as you were saying four and eight, two years ago, and we forgot what Shaw and prior to him, Harbaugh had built at Stanford. Since then, the last 10, 15 years, four and eight is an absolute aberration. 
If you just think that's going to become the norm at Stanford now, that they're just going to become what Stanford was in the early 2000s pre-Harbaugh, I'd take you up on that bet. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take David Sean, the foundation that those two staffs have built over, over a decade now that it, we'll see a lot more bull appearances and uh, contending for a Pac-12 North than we're going to see four and eight years. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, you know, and probably outside of all the announcements, all the teams, all that kind of stuff, the, the other biggest news of the day, George Klyovkov, the, the new Pac-12 commissioner, he said that they're implementing a new football strategic working group. And the idea is that they're going to basically reevaluate everything they do. And it's going to be uh, led by Merton Hanks, associate commissioner, as well as uh, all the head coaches, all of the athletic directors. And they're basically just going to go through one by one by one and say, this needs to change. And he brought up some examples like they have the nine game conference schedule. And he said himself, this does not give us our best chance of getting a team in a college football playoff. And that's what we're going to do is figure out what the best way to do that is. Um, also mentioned the, the kickoff times, you know, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., whatever kickoff times. I think that those might be gone after this working group. Uh, the, what was really? the other big one? The <laughs> other big one was... Uh, oh, So I guess there's a focus on maximizing the product. Absolutely. And he said, yeah. you know, it's a kind of like a we have two goals here. Get teams into the college football playoff, win national championships. And when we go through all of this, we are doing whatever gives us the best chance to do that um, because he didn't seem to think that was what was happening before. What do you think of that, though? Nine game conference schedule. Got to get uh, rid of it, right? Oh, the other one was divisions. Yeah. That's right. Getting rid of the divisions in the entire league. Oh, Just take the top, gosh, top two, put that. them in the, in the championship game. Yep. I do love that. Yeah. Um, there, it, the one thing is the divisions are kind of nice in the Pac-12 because it, it is like the one remaining conference where regional, like there's actual mm -hmm. regional sense to yep. how the divisions are split. Um, it's not just done at random. And then, you know, you run into the, the championship game between the top two teams just being a game that's been played already. But you run into that most years anyways. Um, no, I mean, that sounds like someone who understands where the Pac-12 is in um, mm -hmm. in the greater scheme of things and what's it going to take for the conference's survival and viability going in the future. You know, I, Larry Scott just came at this from a completely different perspective. Yeah, they're trying to go into a new world and media deals and how can we get creative with media deals and mm -hmm. how can, you know, restructuring the Pac-12 and adding teams and all that stuff. It, it was just a different world. Now you're faced with, you know, I mean, truly survival because that's on the table within the next five years. And are we going to be left out from the super conferences or will we be a super conference? And the only way to yeah. even Get in the super conference conversation to me, Hank, is a lot more playoff appearances because right now yep. they're kind of the forgotten fun conference from the West who only mm -hmm. people out West and even then uh, mostly alumni of those schools or nerds mm -hmm. like you and I who, you know, we're not Pac-12 yeah. alumni, but we, we love college football and we think the Pac-12 is yep. as fun or maybe funner than any conference to watch. It is. But f fun ain't selling tickets, apparently. So we need a little more than just fun. Yep. And it is so nice. It is a totally different approach. Um, it's great. Just, just in every way. I mean, even just yeah. the fact that he can come in and just kind of bash what happened before. You know, he, he got a question today. It's like, what do you think of the distribution of the Pac-12 network? How's that going? And the Pac-12 network, as I'm sure you've heard, is in like 16 million households compared to like the Big Ten network in 60. It's impossible uh -huh. to get. You know, even me, myself, somebody <laughs> who only wants two channels, I want to be able to watch Altitude because the Rockies or the Avs and Nuggets, uh -huh. we can, turns out they're not on there, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> and I want the Pac-12 network. There is no way. 
for me to get toughie. those two those two things together. Yeah. Yeah. How is that a world we live in? But, but the point is he can just come in and say, um, let's see. I have the quote right here. There it is. I wish distribution was better. And then later on, he just said, just being honest, the distribution is not where I would like it to be. And just say that bluntly instead of talking yeah. around it and saying, well, we tried this and in the next couple years, but then to follow it up and say, well, the way the contract is written, there really isn't anything we can do right now. It's tough to get it anywhere else right. because there's just rules that we have to follow with the people that we've signed agreements with. Um, but we kind of just have to look forward to 2024 and set our fans expectations for there. And then that's when we'll be able to reset the distribution. It's just like, okay, admit there's a problem. Give us a timeline. Yeah. We're cool. dealing with reality. We're not in some pac 12 Palo Alto, like, Oh, we're going to do things way different than everyone else. Uh, it's sports and entertainment, man. You don't need to redesign the wheel, but you need more. You you need more of a marquee product and marquee names, whether that's teams or players, to yep. have to have more national appeal and go beyond the regional appeal, which I think I think is great. But what do I know? I also bring a very different perspective since I, you know, I'll, I'll consume football in all forms. You do. You do. Um, and the other big news, the other big conversation, realignment. And he was asked about it, um, had some interesting things to say that the general tone was, we don't need to do that. We look at what we have now. We're happy with what we have now. He also said he thinks they're in a better position if Oklahoma and Texas go to the SEC and read into that what you want. I read into it. The Big 12 was maybe a half step ahead of the Pac-12. Yeah, yeah. Because of those two teams, though, and now uh, now they're in trouble. Um, and I think no. he senses that, but he did say, we'll listen. And he, he kept every door open, asked, like, do you need AAU schools, research schools, secular schools, whatever? And he said, there's, there's no prerequisites. We're just going to take a look, and if they're worth it. And to me, I... I kind of agree with him. You know, you look at the way realignment has been going for the last couple sessions. There's a lot of teams that get put into power five conferences, but not a lot that leave. You look at what the big 10 did adding Michigan and Rutgers. And it's like, I bet they wish they hadn't done that. And if you look over and it's like Oklahoma state, you can make a good case for Texas tech. You can make a good case for a lot of the, uh, that's where it gets sketchy. And all of a sudden you you might be stuck with, uh, with uh, some some schools you don't want pretty quickly down the road. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, what's the what's the second shoe to drop? Kansas will be yep. very appealing. I think there'll be a bit of a bidding war over Kansas. Um, but you know, does the Big Twelve in their attempt to survive start poaching from the Mountain West, and that then create a void to where the Pac-12 can? Uh, can get in on some Mountain West teams who maybe are more natural, cultural, and regional um, fits. But again, it sounds like we're dealing with reality and practicality um, and, and facing some different obstacles than what Larry Scott was dealing with, where it mm -hmm. uh, truly is, you know, do we want to be a, con uh, a conference of principle and, um, you know, fitting certain institutions or do we want to be a conference that survives and Absolutely. uh you know uh finding that perfect compromise is going to be quite important for sure definitely um you know and just a little bit more on that um there was a texas tech report that came out and i actually haven't seen it for myself um, but a reporter who asked the question basically said, so, so this report came out since you've been on the stage that Texas Tech has been talking with the Pac-12 about potentially joining the Pac-12. Um, and I really liked what George had to say. You know, he'd said before, like, we're not really getting into the weeds here. But mm -hmm. his answer to that was, we're not going to talk about any individual school. We're not going to negotiate in the media. That's just not the way we do business. What a great look. Just say we're yeah. we're keeping that to ourselves. We're not doing this here. I, I just love that. And in a sense, he's also telling you, 
I am not telling you that we're not doing that. You definitely did not do that. Which is which is great. Like what he said is great. What he didn't say is also maybe just as great. Um, I totally agree. And frankly, Texas Tech, everything I've known about the Pac-12 to this day seems like an outlandish fit. Outlandish. But who knows? You know, who knows? Who um, knows? I mean, they've got to go somewhere, right? Totally. And, you know, how much are you murking things up for Texas if you take tech? And, you know, how much do Texas yeah. lawmakers get involved? You know, how much are you just mucking it up for the others while you try to get yourself back on your feet? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we'll finish this topic with this. Uh, the I think the last question of the day was about um, basically saying, you know, Texas, Oklahoma, they're going to be moving the SEC in one year, three years. Do you guys have like some sort of timeline for, for this stuff? And he said, it's a priority to consider all of the alternatives that have been presented to us. And we will do that in a very timely manner. So mm -hmm. I do think this is going to be moving quickly because I mean, that's, that's what you expect. No, right? you have to, you have to, you have to. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, whether, whether there are changes, whether there aren't changes, yeah. I think, I think we might be getting some news soon if, if there is news that comes. And again, like I said, I could be convinced by Oklahoma state, Texas tech is probably the other one that you look at and say, I could see how that would fit. They, they would add something instead of just being another team to, to say that you have another team. Um, I feel like Kansas is, is, is that. Kansas? Mm -hmm. <sighs> it's just so tough. I mean, Kansas is just so different than anywhere else. You know, it's what typically basketball revenue is worth 10% of your TV deal. Yeah. Kansas offers nothing football-wise. And, and do you take them because... You know it's going to hurt you football wise, but basketball wise, they are the brand. It's a I tough mean, conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a tough football wise. They have the money and resources, and maybe a change of scenery could do them mm -hmm. a lot of good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think you know, outside of Notre Dame football, if you were to rank the entities that would be available, Kansas basketball would be top four or five for me. Um, yeah. You know, so and how much does that raise the Pac-12 to become? Are you talking about it as the premier basketball conference? Is it still a step behind the Big Ten, but it's now in the conversation as the second best? I don't know, but it, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that'd be interesting for sure. Yeah, well, now with Texas and Oklahoma and the SEC, those are strong basketball programs going to a conference that has some strong basketball programs. The basketball yeah. side of things is pretty interesting too. Yeah, it really is. It really is. There's a lot to figure out for sure. Yep. Okay. So uh, to everybody watching, we're having some issues getting the videos of the interviews. Mm. We'll, uh, we'll see if those come through. Uh, plan right now though, take one more real quick break, touch on a couple of things that uh, Carl had to say today about the buffs and then uh, get out of here. And if we can't get those up, we'll, we'll upload them to YouTube. We'll put them in the podcast version of this, all that kind of stuff. Um, kind of just have to play it by ear when the technology is not good. Um, but Unfortunate. before we get into what Carl had to say, got to give a shout out to oh, Green Mountain Dental. Oh, Love yes. those people. Yes. So I, uh, I got here and uh realized very quickly that i had forgotten the pair of jeans i was going to wear so i didn't have to wear athletic shorts around town and that mm. i had also forgotten my toothbrush oh boy. and uh so here's the thing so it was supposed to be like if you're vaccinated you uh you don't have to wear a mask today um but la county like last week whatever went back to you have to wear a mask inside no matter what and so I was like, well, you know what? We can deal with this later. I'm not waking up early to go get a toothbrush. So I'm, I'm just going to wear a mask anyway. It's not like anybody's mm -hmm. going to know. Mm -hmm. Then I remember I'm doing interviews with my mask on. I was like, uh, and I don't think it's like that. But, but the point is, don't be like me. Take care of your teeth. Green Mountain Dental will absolutely help you do it. They are uh, great people. They're huge Colorado yes. sports fans. Yes. 
They're a family owned dentistry. So you feel good going there. Um, we've had a couple of our coworkers go there. We've had listeners go there and everybody's had really great things to say about them and how much they care. That is the one thing you hear about the most. Um, and as you probably noticed on the boat at bottom of your screen, there is a really awesome deal that they've got going. Um, if great. you get a cleaning x-ray and exam from green mountain dental, you will get yourself a free Sonicare toothbrush mm -hmm. basically pays for itself. Um, it's a great deal. It's like in Lakewood, 15 minutes away from downtown Denver. So if you're looking for somewhere to go get your teeth cleaned, that is the answer. Nice. Okay. Um, start with Nate Landman. He is progressing well. I was going to let him say that for himself. Um, but Carl also talked about it and said all the things we expect him to say. You know, he's a great leader. He's uh, he's Nate. Like we always expect him, expected him to be ahead of schedule. That's just who he is. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'm not surprised either. I don't think anybody's surprised. It is good news, though. And uh, Nate told me that he uh, he's going to... Basically, he's ready to go. But Carl said he'll be 100% by the middle of camp is, is the plan, uh, which is obviously huge news for the Buffs mm -hmm. with him coming off a torn Achilles just yeah. nine months ago. Right. That's going to be really big. And then Absolutely. what to expect from him, though? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is it is a question. And again, I know which side I'm on. I am never going to doubt Nate Landman because it just seems like just in general a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it is true. You know, coming off an injury like that, it's concerning. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's... Uh... Uh -huh. It's not great, but how early he is in his recovery, uh, that's pretty promising. Yep. And uh, the other other quote we pull from uh, Carl talking about Nate is this. Now, the better, better oh yeah, the better part of this thing is that we did build our defense through the portal and some other acquisitions on our team that he doesn't have to make every play, which is what he did the last couple of years. It's going to be good to have other players around him that are really good players that he can just do his job and allow for others to do theirs. That's a uh, that makes it sound like a couple of those transfers are going to be important no players kidding. for CU this year. I wasn't expecting to hear something like that from Carl. Yeah, no kidding. He seems uh, pretty confident with the depth and uh, mm -hmm. some of these guys being able to contribute immediately. Yep. Um, on the quarterbacks, obviously, there's not anything new that's happened basically reiterate what we knew it's a two-man competition between brendan lewis and jt shroud there's plenty to like about both of them um he did say though they want to uh they won't have a starter within the first couple of weeks of camp probably around somewhere in the middle of camp he made it sound like maybe even later and it seems like this is the sort of thing that always drags on to the end of camp but who knows if somebody goes out there and wins it maybe maybe two weeks is at least when we start looking. Hmm. Interesting. Um, talked a little bit about coaching receivers. Said that uh, it can be kind of tough on those guys because, as he said, he's a hard-ass receiver coach. And then apologized for using the word ass. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Nice Dimitri event. Stanley, by the way, did agree with that. <clears throat> said, yes, mm -hmm. he is intense. Um, again, just little tidbit there. Not much news. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Happy yeah, about the new commissioner. Happy yeah, about all right. that process, all that kind of stuff um, that they're about to go through. Uh, said very good things about Shannon Turley, the new strength coach, who was also uh, hired the year or what the year before Stanford's big turnaround, and was there up until two years ago. He took a year off and is now in Boulder. Uh, Nate also had good things to say to me about him, which is what you want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, all all good stuff, Henry. I guess what you'd expect from the from media availability. You're not you're not exactly gonna hear anything terrible. They're not gonna tell no. you like, boy, this five wide every play. This quarterback competition's been terrible, frankly. Uh, uh -huh. I'm worried at this point that we don't have a single viable quarterback for our team, let alone uh, one. You know, so yeah, no, didn't say that. 
good. That's <laughs> but hey, great, great that they didn't. <laughs> All right. So we don't have those interviews. We will put those up on YouTube. Uh, yeah. We'll be all over Twitter saying when that happens. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, they'll also be in the podcast version of this, um, which I guess I can get up pretty quickly because I have that audio. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, look for the, uh, the tweet that comes out when the podcast is up. And at the end of that, right after me saying this right now, will be those two interviews with Dimitri Stanley and Nate yes. Lehman. All right. Uh, that's going to be it for today. Thanks for doing this with me, Dre. Uh, Kale, Thank great you. work behind the scenes. And uh, I'll be back in town in a couple days, I guess. See you.